class, this is Mr. Wallington. We are back for chapter 10. Can you believe we're already in week seven? Man, the time is really flying. Okay, what are we going to talk about this week? Ethics, morals, and law. Okay, let's get into this. Let's look at some definitions. Ethics, what is ethics? The science of human duty. That's an interesting uh, uh, phrase, isn't it? The science of human duty. And I like this right here. Ethics is more concerned about the process of making a decision than the actual decision itself. So when we look at these processes uh, or look at the approaches, there's different ones. Okay, the first one we're going to talk about is the the deontological or duty-based ethics. And really... Access where we examine the nature of actions and the will of the agents rather than the results. And what that really comes down to is the means are more important than the end. Now, on the flip side of that, kind of 180 out is what we call the consequentialist ethics approach. And really, to, to wrap this up, it's talking about where the end is more important than the means, meaning that. Okay, doesn't matter how we got to this point. What we got here, we're making money, and so it's okay. And those two are kind of actually, you know, diametrically opposed. A couple other areas, a couple other ways or approaches is relativism and egoism. And both of these fit pretty closely together because they really deal more with the, the humanistic side of us. Uh, relative, relativism is where we're saying that there are no rules. There are no standards, you know. Uh, the question of whether or not an actual action is moral or whatever, or it is in context in which it's placed. So we can do pretty much what we want. Egoism is very similar. As long as it benefits me, as long as the greatest good is for me, as long as it's me, me, it's all about me, you know, it sounds like pride, you know, being lifted up. Yeah, that is egoism. So those are different approaches to ethics. <clears throat> so morality. So when we think about morality, like I said, that's the relationship of the relation of conforming or not conforming to a moral standard or rule. And it's really like I said, the practice of moral duties. Yeah, and uh, uh, all of us, we hopefully we try to live a moral life. None of us are good enough on our own. So thank God for Jesus Christ and his grace and his mercy. Whew. Because morality on its own is pretty hard to achieve. Now, law. When we talk about law, in general, I mean, a pretty common definition, it's a rule of being or based on conduct. It's a rule of being or of conduct. And it's established by someone, an authority, who has the ability to enforce its will. So if you can't enforce the law, is it really a law? If you don't have the ability to, uh, the authority to enforce it. So really, as we look at law, we look at morality, we look at ethics, there is a relationship between them uh, because, you know, you can have ethical law, you can have moral law, uh, there's ethics and morality that there's a blending there as well. So when we think about ethics, what is that? That governs our professional interactions, like at work, you know, do I steal the ink pens from work or not? Professional. That's professional. Uh, how do I go about uh, doing business in the marketplace? Morality, that governs private and personal interactions. How I treat one another is uh, what I'm doing. Is it of a moral standard? And the law, it governs our society pretty much as a whole. So some different sources of law, natural law. Well, unwritten laws that we'd say everybody understands. Constitutional law, we got treaties, legislation, different types of regulations, you know, the court appointed law, uh, contracts, policy standards, and really kind of in the workplace, this is where we see the standards, policy, and contracts. But one source of law that I always love talking about is what? Yes, God's law, because that is the original source of law. That is where the, the law as we know it, even even when we talk about natural law and constitutional law, they're still based on God's law. Isn't that right? Yeah. So now we understand those three those three components. Let's look into our computer crimes. So what is the nature of computer crimes? Computer crimes have really shifted the landscape of um, 
of, of crime. It, it's, it's kind of moved it from physical assets. So I'm not breaking into your house to steal, you know, your jewelry now to more intangible assets. I want to break into your company and gain as much uh, intellectual property as I can. Things of that nature, things that are more intangible. I mean, tangible things are still getting stolen. Don't get me wrong. They are. Um, also, there's no boundaries, no physical constraints when we talk about computer crimes. Um, Cheap and uh, ubiquitous, yes. Uh, it doesn't take a lot of, of money. It doesn't take a lot of knowledge sometimes, you know, like script kiddies we talked about, um, to be able to um, implement computer crimes. And, and the damage now we can do is very large. It's not just regional. Now we can have a global effect on many, many people. And probably one of the biggest things is that you actually compute, most computer crimes still today go unpunished. So when we think about a definition of computer crimes, the Justice Department, this is a Justice Department definition. It says an illegal act for which knowledge of computer technology is essential for either its per, uh, perpetration, investigation, or prosecution. So if you think about this before the internet, even computer crimes were still very, very localized. I mean, they were really, you had to have physical access to that computer to be able to steal or manipulate or destroy information on that computer. Now with the internet, I can sit in the comfort of my own home with my favorite beverage, and I can now commit uh, heinous com computer crimes across the globe, internationally. Uh, and also, actually, with the computer crimes, we can break laws across uh, geographical uh, boundaries, whether state, national, international boundaries. What are some elements of these? Now, when we think about elements of a crime, one, you've got to be a criminal act. And two, it has to be criminal intent, um, the thoughts and intent of man's heart. The intent has to be there. So if a hacker who breaks into uh, unintentional places, have they, have they met the requirement for criminal intent? Interesting question. As a matter of fact, it reminds me of a case that happened uh, several years ago where a young kid, he's probably I think he's in his teens, uh, was just out surfing through the, around the internet uh, in its early days, and he ended up on a government computing, computer system that wasn't protected. And so he, he just went in, you know, kind of made his way into that computer system and had access to a lot of sensitive information. Well, this was very interesting because when it went to court, you know, the, the, the federal government wanted to, to prosecute the young man. But at the time, it was like, well, did he really commit a crime? Because he was just wandering around. The, the intent wasn't there. There was no criminal intent that the government could prove, uh, which is why today, if you work on any government uh, computing system, you always now have this banner that comes up that says that by clicking on this banner, you consent that you are um, accessing a U.S. government computer and you will be monitored and things like that. The purpose of that is that now you just don't unintentionally walk through a door. So now there have to be um, malicious intent if you're not authorized to be on that system. So some of the problems with, the, with that we face uh, in this arena also is trying to establish the identity of perpetrators because now it's not that easy because with backdoors, with, um, with botnets and things of that nature, I can be uh, attacking or, or I can be doing some type of malicious activity and you will never see me. What you may see is you're getting spam from a lot of other people's computers that I'm controlling. Uh, also establishing jurisdiction. So if I'm sitting in my home in Texas and I'm cracking into a bank in uh, Japan, who has authority? Okay, who, who has juris, uh, jurisdictional authority? Is it the state of Texas? Is it the country, United States? is a Japan. So you see the jurisdiction is very difficult. Now, computer crimes can also be classified. They can be classified two different ways, how the computer uh, is used or who the crime impacts or affects. So let's look at the first one, classified by the, how the computer is used. Now, if a computer is used as a target of a crime, meaning that I am trying maliciously to access, manipulate, or destroy some information on your computer. That is the target. Or a computer can be used as a tool in the commission of a crime. Uh, things like child pornography, uh, billing scams. Okay, I'm using that uh, computer in, to carry out that particular crime. Also, it could be incidental to a crime. Uh, money laundering, like drug dealers. You know, my crime is I'm selling drugs. I just happen to be using my computer as the 
back-end system that does the accounting. So three different ways it, it based on how the computer is used. It could also be classified by who it affects. Let's say, uh, for instance, uh, crimes against people or businesses, you know, and there are some examples of those, identity theft, uh, stalking, harassment, or it could be crime against properties, you know, commercial espionage, trespassing, uh, vandalism, you know, data, data uh, mining, data thieves, or crimes against the government. As you're looking at now, trying to attack critical infrastructure or terrorism, uh, things of that nature. Okay, so now we've looked at uh, ethics, we've talked about morality, uh, morals, the law, a different uh, to kind of dev, dev into computer crimes. Now we're going to shift gears quickly, just a couple of slides, to talk about privacy. When we think about privacy, first, there's a lot of laws that already govern privacy. And this is not an inclusive list. This is just something that I happen to find out there. Um, but yeah, a lot of laws. But one in particular... I just want to bring to your attention because this is uh, very recent. Uh, I think around Jan uh, April of uh, this year, uh, this or May, maybe May, April. No, uh, yeah, February, April. This came into being. Of uh, no, I'm sorry, not this. Year. This is 2019. This was 2018. Wow. Yeah, that was back in May of 2018. Who losing track of my years? GDPR, GDPR, General Data Protection Regulations. Now, what this is, is a rule intended to protect the data of citizens within the European Union. You're talking, you know, Great Britain and those countries. Now, you probably wonder, well, what does this have to do with us over here in the U.S. of A.? Well, we'll talk about that. Like I said, what it covers, this covers any information that can be classified as personal details or that can be used to determine your identity. Also, it says that parental consent will be required to process any data related to children 16 years and younger. Some examples of that, things like your name, photos, email address, social media, uh, medical information, IP addresses, bank details, all of these things. Now, where the impact come in, especially from a business perspective, is that information that's stored in a cloud or even on a separate physical location is subject to penalties, is subject to pro prosecution under this law. So, now you see that it's not just Europe. Now, if you're working for an organization that does business globally, internationally, or you're working for someone that uh, like Amazon that, that stores data for multiple entities in a cloud environment, now you could be liable for um, not disclosing, not handling privacy information in the right way. So GDPR, I just want to touch on that. If you haven't heard of that, uh, definitely if you're interested in cybersecurity, you know, that you go out and um, take, a, uh, take a meander, read up, and get a little more up to date on GDPR. So, okay, so let's talk about information, I mean, uh, intellectual property, because a lot of our personal information, some of it, it deals with intellectual property, knowledge that we own that we don't want to get out there. All right, here's a dilemma, because here's what the, the, the internet, the, the digital age has brought about, is that the, with such widespread, a, a widespread ability of unauthorized duplication and dissemination of creative works or, or intellectual property, IP. Now, from that, it has prompted um, a lot of different technology and tools that companies are using to try to, to stop that called DRM, uh, Digital Rights Management Technology. So that's kind of the dilemma. So what is IP? Intellectual property yes, it, it refers to creations of the mind, inventions, uh, literary, artistic work, symbols, names, images, all these things are considered intellectual property. Four categories of intellectual properties, patents, uh, trademarks, copyrights, trade secrets, all of these. Uh, yeah, I think we all probably familiar with patents. You put that on, if you have an invention, you get a patent. Trademarks, that's like a name, you know, like Ford, that's a trademark. Uh, copyright uh, has to do with things like songs, music, videos, um, movies, all those, uh, poetry, all those type of things you would get a copyright. Trade secrets, that's something that companies try to, you know, like a formula for Coca-Cola or whatever it may be, <clears throat> would be considered a trade secret. Interesting thing with trade secrets is that, okay, these other three categories, yeah, I could sue if, 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 if uh, with patent infringement, co uh, copyright infringement, trademark infringement. A trade secret is up to the owner of that trade secret to keep it secret. If it ever, once it gets out, 
there is no recourse. There's no uh, way to reconcile that. So when we think about a trade secret, that's why companies work so hard to keep trade secrets secret. And looking at IP law. So when we think about intellectual property law, it's really trying to serve as an economic incentive to promote, you know, the, the general uh, generational, I mean, the, the, the generation, the creation and the distribution of creative works and trying to keep people who, who are unauthorized from uh, proliferating uh, intellectual property. Some of the laws that covers that, like say Title 17, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, and, actually, and, and the World Intellectual Property Organization Treaty, the WIPO. Actually, and we know digital, I mean, uh, information, uh, intellectual property, man, mouth's going dry here, is uh, recognized to be what very extremely, extremely uh, valuable. Uh, really, in today's society, information is really key. So, and if you're able to gain competitive advantage uh, with information, then in, in most companies, that's why they try to protect it because it is valuable. And because of that, we always look at, well, what's fair use? When we say fair use, uh, that's that balance between do I copyright everything or do information, should it be just shared freely to everyone to use? Now, some of the things that we look at, kind of a litmus test, is what is the purpose and the character of the use, uh, including whether it was commercial or was it non-commercial? Uh, what was the nature of the work? How the amount and substantiability of the portion of the work used or the effect of the use upon the potential market? An example of this, you know, is privacy or fair use. Okay, actually, because this is this is still an ongoing battle. Here, YouTube. Okay, you have a mother gets sued by Universal Music Group. Universal Music Group, they were the ones who did uh, a, a lot of the, the, the music production uh, for Paisley Park or for Prince, Prince's song. Anyway, this mother has a 13 year old baby who's back there dancing because the, the song Let's Go Crazy, Let's Go Crazy. Da, 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 da. Anyway, the baby's back there dancing and she records it on her phone or whatever and puts it out on YouTube and everybody's loving it. Great little video of a 13 month old dancing with Prince music playing in the background. Well, she gets sued. Hmm. Why? Well, because um, that's Prince's music and that music is being uh, used in an unauthorized fashion, depending on your point of view, depending on how you view that. So is this fair use of media or is it privacy? of a cultural icon's intellectual media property. And you see now how that battle can rage. Because you might, at first glance, people say, what, what, what's the big deal? Prince, come on. But let's say that YouTube video goes viral. And, you know, it gets, you know, 15 million hits. And now this mother and the baby, they get advertisement offers and everything else based on intellectual property that wasn't theirs. You know, does the prince estate, do they, uh, should they share in that as well? So you see there, are, there are, it's a gray area, very great, very gray area. Another case, another case. Um, this, is, this was a very historical landmark case. This was Sony and versus Universal City Studios. In 1976, Universal City Studios and Walt Disney sued Sony, uh, seeking them to take, have the Betamax VCR impounded as a tool of piracy. Now, I know a lot of you guys probably never heard of a Betamax, but if you, if, if you go talk to your mom and dad and say, Mom, Dad, did you guys have a, VA, a, VA, a VCR? And they're going to go, yes, son, or yes, daughter. Uh, we had a VHS, and we really liked it. Well, anyway, there were two competitive brands, VHS and Betamax. Those were the two technologies at the time. Sony produced the Betamax, and you had a plethora of other companies uh, that produced v VHS. VHS won out. That's why Betamax didn't get that much playtime. But Betamax was actually on the scene first. It was a VCR. So you had a video uh, cassette recorder. And so, and, and so Sony gets sued because they're saying because you can record uh, live TV programming, this is piracy. Well, the Supreme Court in 1984 disagreed ruling that home taping of television programs for later viewing or time shifting constituted a fair use. That's why today, you know, you can record anything off the air and, you know, nobody cares. You got, you know, Blu-rays and everything else and DVRs that you can record things. 
Um, so like I said, it was, it was uh, a, a, a groundbreaking case, really was, for, from the perspective of fair use versus privacy. So when we say uh, digital rights management, we're talking about technology, different types of software, and a lot of companies, you know, whether it's Apple, Sony, Microsoft, they all have their ways of trying to block people from um, making copies of their their digital media. Uh, now, at the end of the day, a lot of companies have backed away from that. Why? Because with technology, it's so easy to circumvent most of it. So the money and effort they were spending on DRM was greater than what they were saving um, was from pirated music. So they've, they've kind of backed away. But they're still, you know, especially if you look at Apple, iTunes, and some of the, the big streaming um, industries, yeah, they they're, they're still have these DRM technologies in place. So when we think about DRM and copyright laws, okay, let's look at this. Because is DRM trying to protect copyrights? Okay, you know, you can go to um, a bookstore, buy a book, you could take that book to Kinko's or Office Max, and you could sit there and you could copy every page of that book and recreate that book if you wanted to. And you could make a copy of that hard, uh, uh, of that hard cover book that you bought. Is that infringement on copyrights law? So is that what would keep you from doing that? No. It's the cost, it's the effort, and the quality of the copy. All these things is what have kept people for years not making copies of hard copy books, just the amount of work involved. Now, but today you can take that same book in a digital format and, and can easily copy it and distribute it with minimal effort at all. So that's why when you look at um, a lot of your e-readers, uh, Kindles and things like that, yeah, you can read it, I mean, you can only copy but so much. If you ever notice, you can make copies, but you can only copy so much before the software goes boop, that's all you can copy. And some you can't copy at all. So, um, so, but when we think about DRM, the purpose of DRM isn't to uphold the copyright law. It's really to protect your digital works. Interesting, huh? Now, another kind of a case for this was Napster. If you remember Napster, they were a peer-to-peer, -peer, one of the first peer-to-peer -peer sharing of MP3s across the internet. Like that you could go in and share music. There's still quite a few peer-to-peers, but but Napster was one of the first. Now the two bands, uh, Metallica, who was a, what, a metal band, and rapper Dr. Dre, you know, it's chronic, uh, were instrumental in filing a lawsuit against Napster's practices. And when they found out that Napster has been sharing their MP3s royalty-free across the internet. So yeah, the Napster was sued in 2000 uh, for that. And uh, so when we think about this, in conclusion, the age of digital technology have, have introduced a lot of complications, really has, really has a lot of issues with uh, fair use of privacy, or piracy, with, uh, when it comes to, the, to your private IP, your intellectual property. Like I say, now you got kind of two groups on the far, kind of like politics. Over here on the far left, you've got people who just believe that everything should be free for everything, and we should all wear hemp, and and nothing should have, um, you know, any any ownership on it of it, and just because it's all about human creativity in this digital millennial area, and then and just share it all. Then over here on the other side, on the other side of the aisle, we have the ones who are staunch believers that. Everything is kept as copyrighted. You own 100% of that. I don't want anybody sharing it. I don't want anything. I don't want it moving without me knowing about it and without me getting my royalties and without my expressed written consent. So you got these two camps. And, and, and really, the most of us, we kind of fall in the middle. We, we realize that, yeah, yeah, I probably should buy a record and I'll buy a CD or MP3, download it, and so that the artist can get the money for, for it. But if someone, you know, if I can get it off to YouTube, I may get it, you know, one myself. I don't know. So what does that come down to? Is that a matter of law? Is it a matter of ethics? Is it a matter of morality? Or is it all the above? The debate rages on and on. Hey, guys, I hope this was a... Uh, a little uh, intriguing for you uh, when we talk about DRM, intellectual property, uh, computer crimes, and how they all tie back to either from a legal perspective, an ethical perspective, or moral perspective. God bless you. Have a great week. 
If you have questions, comments, don't hesitate to call, email, uh, send me a text. God bless. Mm -hmm.